All right. Good morning. Great to have you all here. You're very daring. You're coming to a very difficult topic now. <laughs> so you obviously want to learn something. We are together in this challenge, um, and I will explain to you a little bit why. Um, so I'm Hendrik Esser. I'm working um, at, a, at a telecom company called Ericsson, um, very large organization. In that organization, I have uh, done a, a pretty normal management career, you can say. Uh, so starting as a software engineer, project manager, project office manager, head of uh, uh, operations and, and programs, and so on. And um, I have a lot of experience and background now in large-scale agile transformations. Um, and uh, at the moment, I'm having a very interesting role, and that is I'm a sort of in-house consultant or organizational coach. Uh, the formal title is Manager Special Projects, yeah? and um, I'm, I'm running around a business area of 15,000 people, and I'm trying to help this organization to evolve and take the next step. And that next step for us is really business agility, you could say. We are not talking about business agility. We are more like discussing how the world we live in, what that does to us, and how we could respond to this one. And um, in parallel, I'm also doing a lot of voluntary work, and, and one thing I'm, I'm doing is that I'm working for the Agile Alliance as program director for the supporting Agile adoption um, program. So there we are exploring with some thought leaders how can we advance uh, agility in, in organizations. And uh, today I'm going to talk about Agile Finance. Now, I'm not an Agile Finance expert, you will find that probably out at the Q&A. <laughs> but I have been in my roles of running project offices. Uh, um, I've done a lot with um, supplier management, with financial controllers, and so on. And in that background, um, I got in contact with actually IC Agile last year. And IC Agile, I don't know whether uh, you know what that is. IC Agile is a, is a training accreditation um, uh, company from uh, New Zealand, I think. And um, what they are doing is uh, they are providing uh, learning curricula, learning outcomes for certain types of trainings. And they have all sorts of agile trainings, but now that business agility is getting more and more on the agenda, uh, uh, they have also now founded an agile finance track. And um, I was asked last year as a volunteer to um, lead a team of experts from around the globe. And I see one person sitting here. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, to explore what if somebody would offer an agile finance training, how could that look like? What are the learnings outcomes that uh, should be achieved uh, by such a training? And that was a very interesting thing. And why do we do this? There is very little agile finance training and it's not normalized. It's very unclear what agile finance actually all encompasses. And now we have formulated this in a nice compact document where we say these are the learning outcomes and those are actually creative commons. So all you, of you can, actually, it's not yet fully published. It's coming soon. Um, when it's published, you can go to the IC Agile um, web pages and download it and you get some inspiration for um, uh, what does Agile Finance actually mean? Okay, so what am I, going, am I going to talk about today? So this presentation is going a bit along these learning outcomes uh, that we have identified and uh, it starts of course with what does Agile with a fi uh, Finance with an Agile mindset actually mean? And then we are going to look a bit into some uh, disciplines around financial handling and one thing is budget and cost management. We are going to talk a bit about accounting <coughs> and Agile procurement, and I will also very quickly talk about uh, how to do the change, how, how could uh, a change program look like, and how to uh, address the change. So, let's get going. Finance with an Agile mindset. Okay, you have seen this before. Um, who, who, who knows what VUCA uh, means? Uh, we all have, have been discussing this a lot of times, and it has been repeated now by Jürgen uh, in the previous talk, so I don't need to go into this one. We all know these. But what we also see uh, in our companies is that there is a friction. Uh, there is a friction because finance is somehow going against our agile product creation. And um, how somehow we are not friends with each other in our companies. So there are things like the financial targets that we get. They demand predictability, but our agile teams are saying we are ready when we are ready. We cannot predict. So the friction arises, so how much cost do, should we put on, uh, should we reserve for a certain project when we don't know how long the project will take? Um, 
there is a tight budget follow-up coming from uh, the finance community and that feels like, hey, we cannot predict and now you even, uh, yeah, you annoy us with tight follow-up on our financial figures. Um, the funding decisions usually are taken seldom, so um, many organizations and companies are still with yearly budget cycles. Um, budgeting, therefore, is seen as pretty inflexible. So that's one side of the coin. The other side is there is a lot of regulatory requirements. Of course, uh, different countries have different regulatory requirements on how financial reporting must be done and so on. And that has a good reason. I mean, uh, there should not be anybody doing bad things um, like washing money or uh, hiding things or whatever, paying taxes. So there is some reporting guidelines. And the question is like, in how far is this conflicting agility? Um, and that's often people think like, oh, all these regulatory requirements, they are impeding agility. Is that really so? So we are going to look into that one. All right, so dealing with complexity. We are talking about the VUCA world, volatile, un uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and we have learned a lot over the years about complexity. And uh, um, one model that's very often used also in our um, agile product creation is the Kinevin model. Who of you knows the Kinevin model? Okay, not everybody. Um, so this is a, a model that was uh, created by Dave Snowden and there's a Harvard Business Review article uh, from November 2007 which describes this. So I will not go through the whole model, but what the model basically says is as, as uh, uh, employees in a company, as, as leaders, uh, we are confronted with different types of challenges and it really depends on what kind of challenge are we confronted with. Um, is it a challenge where cause and effect can be easily understood? Yeah? So if I do this, this will be the exact outcome. Or is it more unpredictable? If I do this, I don't know what the outcome will be. And one part of this model is this domain of complex. Complex means predictability is not really there. I mean, you could maybe say um, half a year ago, we have taken a certain decision. And uh, as a consequence of that decision, that and that thing happened, and then this was a consequence, that was a consequence. So looking back in hindsight, you can make sense of how you got where you are today. But half a year ago, it was impossible basically for you to say, I take now this decision and this will be the precise exact outcome. And that's a dilemma in, in a world where we try to predict if that predictability is not there. People are asking for guarantees. How can we do that? So um, the Kinevin model uh, suggests how to go about this one. The intellectual language here is probe sense respond. What it actually says is we need to look at the situation we are in, try to make sense. What does this really tell us? What can we do about this one? And um, then you respond, you, you try something. And the approach is a very experimental approach, meaning we cannot know the exact outcome, so we rather do a little experiment, see did this lead into the right direction, and if yes, we go further, if not, we are trying something else. So this is what, how, how you deal with complexity. Now tell this to a financial controller. <laughs> That's of course a bit of a, of a thing, but this is actually what science tells us. Hmm. So how can we use, make use of this one. Um, now, another aspect of the whole thing is um, when we want to adapt finance to agile organizations, I mean, we need to go agile. Agile is the approach to deal with complexity, work in short iterations and so on. Um, so we always use the um, uh, agile manifesto, like individuals and interactions over process and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. Now, when we show this to our friends in HR or in our friends in finance, what do they see? They look at this and they think, oh, individual interactions over processes and tools. Yeah, actually, what interactions do we have here and our financial tools, are those helpfuls, helpful? Mm. In the financial sector, we are actually communicating a lot via tools and databases. Yeah, we are recording figures, we are doing follow-up on figures and so on. Where do we actually interact? Mm, okay, so this might guide us in our thinking a little bit. Working software over comprehensive documentation. What the hell has that, that to do with finance, you think? <laughs> well, nothing. This isn't helpful for finance people. Mm. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Now, that is an interesting one. How does finance focus on the customer? 
Is there a customer focus in finance? Um, how can finance help product development focus on the customer is maybe another question. But somehow we get stuck here. We, we don't know what, what this really means. And then responding to change over following a, a plan. Well, this is an interesting one. How can finance get over these stiff rhythms that we have? That's maybe. We have rhythm, but they are very, very long and they are like, yeah, not, not helpful, seen as helpful. So somehow the Agile Manifesto, is this really helping me being in a finance position? Probably not. So what could we do? Well, there's good news, and those of you who have been on this conference last year saw even a keynote about that one. There's another model which is absolutely compatible with Agile, and that's beyond budgeting. There's another framework, beyond budgeting. And me and the supporting Agile adoption team, uh, Jürgen was part of it. Um, we have once been sitting together with Beate Boxness, who is one of the drivers of Beyond Budgeting, and we have been looking through Beyond Budgeting principles and um, uh, Agile Manifesto and principles just to see how compatible they are and this, they live together wonderfully. So Beyond Budgeting is Agile for HR and finance, you could say. So what does Beyond Budgeting say about uh, this whole thing? And Beyond Budgeting is structured in a little bit different way. So Beyond Budgeting is, is a framework that is enabling business agility and they are distinguishing leadership principles from management processes. So let's look at this one. Leadership principles. There's a purpose. Engage and inspire people around bold and noble causes, not around short-term financial targets. Now, it's a bit like we value this over that from a thinking point of view. Yeah. But there already we, we see not around short-term financial targets. So there is a concrete hint for financial people, hey, this is something I have to think about. Values. Govern through shared values and sound judgment, not through detailed rules and regulations. Oh, that's a tough one for a financial person, right? There's a lot of rules and regulations. What does that mean for me? Transparency. Make information open for self-regulation, innovation, learning, and control. Don't restrict it information open, how much financial information is actually a secret in companies? Does it have to be a secret? Those are the questions arising from, from these things. What would happen if we open up more on our financial figures? Um, organization, cultivate a strong sense of belonging and organize around accountable teams. Avoid hierarchical control and bureaucracy. But isn't this what financial uh, control is about? Yeah, <laughs> hierarchical control. Yeah. So it makes you think. Autonomy, trust people with freedom to act, don't uh, punish everyone uh, if someone should abuse it. That's also an interesting thing. Something goes wrong in our companies uh, and then we want to avoid that this might ever happen again. And what do we do? We introduce a new rule. Often we forget what's the likelihood that this problem might reoccur. Hmm? And if the likelihood that the problem reoccurs is very low, um, maybe you should not add, add another rule because you're just over constraining the organization. Yeah, and then the last one of the leadership principles, customers, connect everyone's work with customer needs, avoid conflicts of interest. That's interesting. It's a clear pointer towards the customer. And then there's management processes and they make this thing even more tangible, yeah? So rhythm, organize management processes dynamically around business rhythms and events, not around the calendar year only. A lot of financial proce uh, procedures are organized around the calendar year and not adhering to business events or business processes. That's quite interesting. Targets, set directional, ambitious and relative goals, avoid fixed and cascaded targets. Plans and forecast, make planning and forecasting lean and unbiased process, not rigid and political exercises. How many people are fighting for a budget because of political reasons? I believe that my uh, unit or my operation is the most important one and I'm fighting for my budget and I even use strange attempts uh, or strange measures to, to get what I want. Um, resource allocation, foster a cost-conscious mindset and make resources available as needed, not through detailed annual budget allocations. Ouch! I mean, how many of us have, have annual budget allocations? Performance evaluation, evaluate performance holistically with peer feedback for learning and development, not based on measurement only and not for rewards only. How do we incentivize? And then the rewards themselves. Reward shared success, shared success, against competition, not against fixed performance contracts. 
So you see that beyond budgeting, uh, leadership principles and management processes, they resonate much, much easier with people who are working in these kind of roles. And as they are compatible, very compatible with the Agile uh, principles and the Agile manifesto, this is maybe the thing that you can recommend to your uh, financial people to look at. Beata has written a wonderful book about this one. I recommend also to read that one. That book also contains concrete examples how this is implemented. And we are going to look into a few aspects of this in a minute. All right, so changes of role of perception. So with all this in mind, it means that the, the financial profession needs to change and the role of financial uh, people is changing. So what we know from the, from the VUCA world is that changes need to be accommodated fast. And that means you need an iterative approach and feedback loops. And that means you need to move from seldom and big decisions uh, to frequent and small decisions. Instead of having the yearly super big budget round where you need months of analysis of what is your business forecast and so on, um, uh, you have to do this in a much uh, faster rhythm. And that means also that <coughs> finance is going from gatekeeping to being an enabler for decision making. Yeah? So the purpose of financial people is much uh, less uh, it, uh, making sure that somebody adheres to uh, a, a set budget, more going into, yeah, how can we enable decision makers around the company, everywhere, maybe even on team level, to take good decisions? How can we feed them with financial data? It goes from controlling towards management decision support, financial trend monitoring. Yeah? So wh where is the world economy going? What does that mean for us? How, how is the financial situation in our business segment going? And so on. So it goes pretty much from yearly rhythms to continuous rhythms, like what we do in, in the agile product development. Uh, um, this is, of course, very painful because these yearly uh, um, exercises, they are heavy, administratively heavy. Lots of people involved, lots of discussions, and they take a long time. And when you then try to do them faster, everybody thinks like, but this cannot be done faster because just look at all the amount of work that's needed for our yearly uh, rhythm. And the thing is, and you maybe know this from your agile product development, if you just go and start increasing the speed, incre uh, shortening the cycles, people are like becoming very creative in seeing how can we remove unnecessary stuff from our heavy processes. So uh, there is actually, a, uh, you create an incentive to make things much more lightweight. And people are creative. W once they start looking into this, they will find a way how to do this. And it's a bit like what we do in the, in the product development. We always talk about continuous integration of our software products. This is like continuous integration of financial data and financial updates into management decision and strategy evolution. So it's really about guiding decision making in the moment rather than enforcing adherence to a previous decision and plans which likely no longer apply. Okay, so. That is a bit like the foundation uh, beyond budgeting principles and the change of role for financial people. Now let's start looking a bit uh, into the, some practicalities of the thing and let's start with budgeting and cost management. So what's the purpose of budgeting? So essentially what you want is that you want to direct your financial resources to the place that provides the most value for the company. And most value for the company of course means you want to have delighted customer but you want to have them also in a profitable way. I mean, just customer delight um, is not the only thing. I mean, you can be very uh, much delighting a customer, but you can ruin your business. Yeah. Um, so how can we do this? Yeah. Where is the place, actually, where money provides, where the return on your investment is the best one? And in a VUCA world, of course, this place where the money is invested best can change very dynamically, and that means we need to have these continuous rhythms and the distribution of the financial resources needs to have about the same pace as the agile product creation. So if we are able to release products not anymore once a year but every month, maybe we also need a financial rhythm that helps us to route the investments in the same speed. So how could this work? And this is the thing that Beyond Budgeting is actually uh, suggesting. So Beyond Budgeting basically says there are three core purposes of a budget. Um, the first one is target setting. Target setting is about what we want to happen. Yeah? So this is the target. Then there's forecasting. That's what we think will happen. And the third one is the resource allocation, what it takes to make it happen. Now these three purposes of a budget, 
they are unfortunately in most companies merged into one process. And when you merge them into one process, you're ending up in a problem. Because then you do something like this. You have, for example, a sales target, you know, which should actually express what we want to happen. And at the same time, you base your forecast on that sales target. So you say, we are going to allocate that and that much money to this thing. And all of a sudden, you actually, you have mixed what we want to happen with what we think will happen. Yeah? What's the consequence? Yeah. The moment uh, we, t we know that these two are connected, and, and you know, usually people are pretty good in understanding what I think will happen, because they have my assumptions, then I get very cautious on what targets I'm going to accept. All of a sudden, people are very cautious on the sales target. Are the sales target then still ambitious and courageous? No, they cannot be. Yeah? By mixing, the, for example, these two processes, um, you're just ruining the whole thing. So it makes a lot of sense to split these three purposes and make one process for each. Yeah? So that's the first thing you should actually do when you go towards beyond budgeting. <coughs> separate the three. And then when you're separating them, then actually you can evolve the whole thing because once the target setting, what we want to happen is separated from we th what we think will happen, then you can make this much more inspiring and motivating and challenging. Then you can say, what we want to happen is this, and we can be very, very bold in this one, because it's safe. You can be very bold. It doesn't mean that you have now a personal, your bonus is, 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 is connected to this one. Yeah? Another thing that is important is make this relative wherever possible. It doesn't make sense to make sales targets in a volatile business environment, because if the whole market goes down, for example, and you miss your target, um, uh, that's not, not a nice feeling. And especially, even it could happen that the whole market is going down, you are performing better than your competitors, for example, and you still don't get your bonus. So you should maybe do something like a relative uh, uh, target setting where you say, hmm, the whole market went down, doesn't really matter, we want to just have X percent more net sales, we want to be better than our competitors or better than the average of our market segment. And the, the, the third one here is holistic performance evaluation. So it's not only about financial targets or whatever, it's about the outcome we create yeah, as, as a result of the company's efforts. Yeah, forecasting, when you separate it, then forecasting becomes a very unbiased thing. The whole gamification of this thing uh, moves away. The forecast is really what we believe, what we truly believe will happen. Yeah? You're, you're not living anymore in dream world. Yeah? And another thing in, in forecasting, which is also very important, is to limit the, the, de the, uh, the, the amount of details. We all know this from our uh, agile product development. The more detail you put, for example, into a plan, uh, the more you are getting into the illusion of control. You think you have it all under your control, but you haven't. So you need to limit this in detail. Yeah, and the resource allocation, of course, allocation of financial uh, resources to wherever it's needed. That should be actually event-driven, not calendar-driven. Yeah. yeah, and that needs continuous mooring ad uh, adaptation where needed and when it's needed. So this is like continuous integration of financial data and continuous learning on a financial side. Um, related to this is a big uh, mindset shift, and that's also an interesting one. It, instead of having one big upfront budget, you go to become cost conscious from the first penny. Actually, you're not losing control, you're actually becoming more cost aware and even more cost obsessed, and it's not only one person, the financial controllers who are uh, the, the shepherds of the budget, it's everyone. Yeah? So traditionally what you have is a budget level, a budget limit, uh, that you maybe have an annual budget or whatever, and the, always when something new comes up, the question is, do I have a still budget left to accommodate this thing? And instead of that, the mindset shift and the way of working goes towards, is this really necessary? You, you have a lot of mini budget decisions, one by one is going iteratively, and by that you have um, uh, much more anchored in the organization, the thinking of, is this really necessary and profitability thinking. Okay, so, so much about uh, budgeting. Um, then a couple of words about accounting. So, Accounting is very often related to regulatory requirements and you could think that regulatory requirements are a very difficult thing to handle because uh, governments are, are imposing a lot of constraints on, on companies. 
But is it really that bad? So examples of regulatory requirements are like you have to produce an annual budget and you need to do your annual reports and so on. Um, then there is things, and that is the thing I was personally involved in uh, quite a bit, was capitalization rules for intangible ex assets. So in now how do we go about in the past when when we had the big product releases once a year or every twice a year, um, it was like, okay, now the product has uh, achieved uh, market availability, now we capitalize the investment that we have t uh, taken. Yeah. Now, with, when you do this iteratively, uh, when, when do you capitalize on things? This can become a very tedious thing. You need to find a way how to do this. Yeah. And um, another example is revenue recognition for work performed under contract. The insight from all this, when you look into this, is that not all financial procedures and regulation need to change in an agile organization. So some of these are really like annual reportings, no problem. This doesn't affect your agile de development or whatever at all. This is just a formal reporting uh, to some institutions. No problem. We can still keep the old procedures. Yeah. But then there's other things like the capitalization thing, there you really need to think. And my experience is when, when you come across this problem and you sit together with your financial controllers and you start thinking, okay, how are we going to do this? You will find a solution. This is not an unsolvable problem. And there's different uh, approaches to this. So what I've seen is, for example, that uh, you, for example, say you capitalize every single feature that you're developing. At the moment the feature is available, you do it. Might be pretty heavy or you make bundles of features once per quarter. Some, some have said we move towards an, an annual run rate on, on uh, a product development, so we capitalize it once per year. There is different ways to do this. It's no rocket science at all. No. And what we find also there is that there are these synergies between agile approaches and the objectives of compliance organizations. So sometimes compliance organizations also would like to, to know where are we with this. And due to the agile approach, also, you get more transparency on things, and transparency is actually something very good when you are talking about financial things. All right, um, then some words about agile procurement. Um, and that's an, also an interesting thing. I mean, I was working with supplier management for a while in Ericsson, and uh, how do you sign contracts with suppliers? Uh, this can be a tedious uh, process. And actually, Ericsson is a supplier to telecom uh, companies. Um, those processes, they are really, really heavy with RFIs, RFQs, tendering, and, and all these kind of things. So, yeah, what we want to achieve is actually partnership. And that's the whole thing that's happening here. When we go forwards agile procurement, it's very, very much about becoming a topic of partnership between vendor and, and orderer. Yeah. So, um, although agile contracts are more collaborative in nature, I mean, generally these contracts are collaborative. So, for example, um, when we execute on an assignment, then um, often we have time and material contracts, for example, with our suppliers. And the supply teams on the, in the supplier organization, they are almost like they are part of our company. Yeah, because we are in one software or product development flow and we don't want to have barriers or hinder hindrances uh, or, or uh, 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 cues in, in, in this one. So we work fluently with each other. Yeah. The question is more, how do we get towards that point where we can have the agile flow? Yeah. And the, the approach there is to co-create a joint agreement based on a shared vision and equal partnership and consider then aspects like intellectual property rights and so on. Now that sounds very high level and, and, and theoretical. There is actually practical approaches. There, is, there are people who have developed a practical approach how to do this. And I'm going to show this. This was one of the persons contributing to the IC Agile uh, finance track, Mirko Kleinert from uh, Switzerland, I think he is, right? Um, and he has been looking into the topic of procurement. And this is the classic procurement flow. So um, you start usually with creating your business model canvas. You're thinking about your business model and so on. And then you think, here are my key partners. Uh, that's one who of you knows the business model canvas, by the way, maybe just to... Okay, a few. So this is a way how to capture a whole business. Alex Osterwalder has created this thing. If you don't know it, go to the web and, and take a look at the business model canvas. It's a really helpful tool uh, for capturing an idea of how a business works. One element in this business model canvas is key partners. 
when you do your, your when you create your product and your value proposition what are my key partners and that's the moment where you're going into procurement so what you usually do is you have your business case and then you have some design study you have a tender document you have your long list of potential suppliers you make a contract uh, um, a specification then you arrive at the short list after some discussions uh, then you um, uh, sign an offer and then uh, you sign a contract and then you can start your agile execution but this takes a lot, a lot of time. Can we, I mean, and, and the study here shows three to 12 or more months just to get towards signing a contract. And that's like eternity in, in the modern world. So how can we make this better and faster? So what they have been finding was that actually we can do this very much faster. The procurement phase can be actually, when you start this in a partnership way, it can start much, much earlier that you start co-creating. And what you do is, okay, you have your business model canvas, and out of the business model canvas, what you get there is, what's the purpose? Why are we going to do this? And that's a very important ingredient. So what you do is, there is something that's called the procurement canvas that these guys have created, also that you can download from the internet. The procurement canvas is guiding you in these contract discussions. And what you actually do is, you invite potential suppliers into one room, and this is almost like a scrum team, a cross-functional scrum team. And from the supplier side, you really want to have people who are later on involved in the execution of the thing. So it's really the people who are going to do the job. You invite them to, this, to the same room and you start sharing with them those parts of the business model canvas that are relevant. Why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this business? What do we want to achieve? And that's actually one part of the procurement canvas that's provided by the orderer. Yeah, and then the second half of the procurement canvas is basically the supplier's answer to these needs. Yeah? So in these meetings, because they are face-to-face, -face, it's like a cross-functional scrum team, you are sitting together for a day, discussing these things, getting a deep, deep understanding. Forget about communicating a tender document and all these nasty lists, communicating via documents. You communicate with people, agile, com uh, col people collaboration over contract negotiation. Yeah? You communicate the purpose. Your vendors are thinking about how could they go about this whole thing. And then sprint after sprint, you refine it. That's the basic idea. And on this path, you might even throw out a couple of vendors. So sometimes there's, of course, a competition. And uh, this guy, Mirko, they have done these kind of things. Like there's three vendors uh, coming in uh, into these meetings. And they're actually competitors. And they all have their, their sprint links. And after a few days already, you see where this is going. Are they able to respond to your business need or not? And you can take those decisions much, much faster. So this very collaborative partnership, still competitive approach, makes you much, much faster. Another important thing maybe to mention is here, because this takes so long, you, all this thing, all this heavy documentation is towards a vision that you have been formulating. And that vision might change. And then it might be that um, you, 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 have, you have created a contract based on, on a vision that is not working. So here, because of the partnership, you have also a lot of sparring partners. Maybe your supplier will say, but wait a second, I don't get this. How is this? And out of the conversation, sometimes you find out, oh, my initial vision was maybe not fully correct. We need to uh, improve it. Yeah? So this is also an opportunity to improve the business situation. All right, and then you are updating as you go, you are updating the procurement canvas and you get deeper and deeper in your understanding of how this collaboration could work. There's four critical ingredients uh, that make Lean Agile procurement work. The first one is remove or minimize the handovers also in the procurement process and that is achieved by putting together a cross-functional team into one room. It's the same thing as with a cross-functional product development team. Same idea, just in a financial sector. Um, include the people who will do the work from the very start. So when you are meeting with your supplier, really ask for those people who are going to be later on the ones uh, taking this further. Mm. Foster collaboration with all your techniques and approaches. So it's really like show the business model canvas, show your whole idea of what you want to achieve and bring all into one room for a sprint-like start of the project. Co-location is very important. Very agile, isn't it? but in a financial way. Yeah. 
So, and then a few words on how to change. So, those are, this is now just a very rough sketch of, of what you can do in the financial sector. How to change? Okay. How does an agile transformation in finance work? I got that question also on this conference in the last days. How do we um, uh, uh, manage to, to get there? So, the most important thing from my point of view is always, first of all, it's a normal transform, agile transformation like in product development, just that they need to use uh, uh, maybe a different thing than the agile manifesto. Maybe they should use the beyond budgeting. Uh, yeah. So first of all, it's not we versus them. If you always complain, if you, we in the product development make ourselves the victims of finance and we are always going in, in a victim uh, approach to them saying, yeah, we could do so much better if you wouldn't have your strict rules and, and nasty regulations. Yeah. That's not helpful. So let's rather embrace it and say, hmm, instead of being next to uh, confronting each other, looking at each other, it's maybe better to say, okay, let's then side by side. Okay, this is our problem. How do we solve this? Yeah, let's join forces. And in, in, in the case of the agile transformation that I was part of, we actually involved the financial people from the very start. Yeah, so if, if you are un at the moment undergoing an agile transformation and you haven't done it yet, yeah, bring some business controllers in. Let them be part of this. Let them understand it. Those are human beings who are actually themselves quite interested in getting empowerment and all these nice things that come with an agile transformation. So their hearts will be very open for this. And then the question is just how do we solve all the problems like capitalization questions and procurement questions together? So the key thing here is really make it also their journey. It's not my journey versus your journey or I'm so right and you are so wrong. Let's make this together. So it starts with a conversation. Yeah? What is our common goal? What do we want to go for? So in summary, agile finance is absolutely not rocket science. This is possible. There is um, uh, assets, knowledge assets and, and tools available. Uh, the Agile Manifesto actually is not so helpful enough for, to guide finance. So here I would really recommend to go for Beyond Budgeting, which is a much more suitable framework. Um, read the book if you like. Uh, invite Beate, he's spe uh, taking speaking engagements. <laughs> yeah. The role of finance moves from a gatekeeper to enabler. That is very, very important from a mindset shift point of view. Separate the three purposes of budgeting, target setting, forecasting, budget allocation. Separate them clearly, have a process for each of them. Yeah. The regulatory requirements can be fulfilled also with agile approaches. There is no, nothing strange with that one. There are sometimes some uh, limitations of it, but not to the extent that it hampers your agile uh, company transformation. Yeah, and use the agile procurement canvas for fast creation of agile contracts. That's another thing I would recommend. All right, and with that, we can open up for questions and we have a microphone over here. Thank you for uh, the wonderful in introduction. So uh, I have a question on the Agile contracts. So in the Agile contracts, it looks like uh, we will engage with the favorite partners. Uh, but many times it, that may not be true. It could be a new territory and we want new kind of uh, partners to be engaged with. How does that work in that space? Can you- With uh, a new partner? Yeah, a new uh, vendor partner uh, who we are dealing with. Mm. Uh, so, so in the example which you showed, uh, it dealt with uh, the favorite vendor partners where you already have some interaction and you know yeah. how to work together. Yeah, so actually, um, yeah, maybe I wasn't clear enough on that one. It doesn't, I mean, Milko has examples where he was inviting not only the favorite partner, but maybe two others they haven't been working with before into the same room. So those three vendors, although they are competing, they're in the same room and they are together discussing with you as an orderer um, the, the, the business model, the business case and, and the procurement canvas. Why, what is the business we are after? What is supposed to be achieved? And then those three vendors, let's say, the one that is maybe the favorite one from the past, but maybe also the two new ones, they go and think, okay, how do we respond to this one? And you integrate it, you come back into the room and so on. So you do this actually together and this transparency creates the dynamics. And on that journey, of course, after a few days, maybe you can say, okay, now here we have the most convincing answer. So the others are out and then you can also argue, you can explain much, much better why certain vendors have not been selected and others have been selected. 
So that's the suggestion that, that Mirko has, and Mirko has also some really real life experience from that one. Because we, we are still struggling in that space uh, yeah. with favorite vendors are vendors who uh, have worked together for a longer period. It is a lot easier. The thing but is, new we, we have a tendency to here. reuse the same vendors as before. But um, yeah, you always need to invite some new people uh, in because of two reasons. One thing is you want to, don't want to lock yourself into one vendor. And the other thing is sometimes it's just good to explore other opportunities to see whether there's somewhere sometimes else. Sometimes it could be just uh, pure competence and uh, that player is uh, really yeah. good in that space. Yeah. Yeah. There is another question. My uh, context of the question is actually a big entity, a, a, a entity which has its own legacy over the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years. And in that context, we are trying to bring this change, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, in your experience, was kind of the top two, three things that, uh, you know, that happened in Ericsson, which actually started bringing this change? And how much of this is a top-down directive or it started mm -hmm. uh, at the top layer and rather than you know went up from the bottom yeah okay that's a good question so actually Ericsson hasn't gone through the whole transformation yet uh, for us one of the first steps was uh, actually uh, that's another interesting thing when you see these we need to go from yearly rhythms to shorter cycles I mean we started with monthly rolling planning uh, the problem that we did in the beginning was that we were still mixing all the three purposes of budgeting into the monthly rhythm, uh, which is, okay, it's, it's a little, it's a tiny step into the right direction. You have a higher frequency. Um, and the good thing and interesting thing with that one was it was not the full step, but at least we started to have a monthly connection point between the product development, for example, and the financial side of the company. And because they were starting to talk much frequent, more frequently to each other, they could also talk about the problems arising and the changes and dynamics in the markets. And that taught uh, the uh, financial people, ah, okay, this is a problem. And people can't help, they want to solve the problem. So they were starting to think, okay, how do we go about that one? And then a bit naturally, we are not yet fully through with this one, these three purposes get separated. So a good starting point is actually to go for higher frequency, create more connection points and more interaction between the financial side and, and the um, uh, product development uh, side, and then it develops a certain dynamics. How much of it was top-down? It was pretty top-down because agile transformations, th that's a, an interesting thing. Many agile transformations start top down and it's like, oh my God, this is not agile. Agile is not top down. The thing is you always need to start from where, uh, where you are. And when you are a hierarchically top down organized company, um, you cannot just from one day to the next say, okay, and now you're self organized. If you're up to it, do it. That doesn't work. Yeah? So um, it, it really, you need to start from the language that people are used to and that language is in the beginning actually a top-down language which means, yeah, you're going to do this now and then, but that's a leadership challenge, take the little step back saying, okay, now that I've told you that, I start to move out. So this is Raj here and uh, I have a question where on one side we have this budget constraints and everything and on the other side we have these agile teams who are made to estimate in terms of let's say story points mm -hmm. and there are a lot of this one where we should not estimate in terms of hours. When you see the traditional budgeting for a project or a product development, we used to just see what is the scope and then we used to see okay how many people are required and how much time it would take based on some expert mm. estimation or whatever and then we will just allocate okay these many people into this is the building rate and this is the total cost of this project or product development. But now the teams are given the autonomy to estimate in terms of story point and then give it back to the uh, whatever. So now the challenge is how to really roll it up from the individual scrum teams or Kanban teams, whatever they estimate, yep. and then to the budget where we still have constraints. Yep. Right? And this is a perfect example where the three things, target setting, forecasted, budget allocation are all intermingled. And Jürgen was talking about this one. How do you prioritize things? You calculate things like cost of delay, which is basically a question for where do I allocate my budget? Where is it most needed? And then the question is really like, what do we think will happen? When you, what you are saying is basically we are mixing those two and you need to separate them. So what we did was, okay, 
we were starting to think about business cases. Okay, we didn't talk about cost of delay so much, but it's one parameter. We think about where do we want to spend our, most of our budget, so how do we prioritize our function, the features that we want to uh, implement. But then from a forecasting point of view, we said, we have uncertainties on these features, so how do we get that one out? You know what? From a budgeting point of view, we are just making an annual frame for product development. We just said, we have X amount of people that are doing product development, and we are just following up on this annual level. So you make it a run rate, and uh, by that you separate these two things. Yeah. It's, and, and of course, we did the follow-up. So let's say um, a, a Scrum team or two Scrum teams work on, on a certain functionality. The, the business case says this has that and that high priority, so it's mo the most valuable thing. Actually, everybody agrees to um, uh, that, that we have to work on. And now, during the development, we find out, oh, there is an increase, uh, increased need of financial uh, uh, funding. Yeah? That's actually okay in that moment because when we did the budget allocation, we were already saying we have a certain uncertainty, uh, uncertainty around this one. We have calculated the cost of delay. We have done a certain an risk analysis. And even in the worst case, we are still profitable with doing this thing. So this is actually a, th a question of budget allocation. And then when it comes to forecasting, yeah, that's, that's a different thing. I will, you really need to separate those two. No, we don't allocate budget to the features. We have an annual frame for a all the software development is having um, uh, an annual frame. And um, then the, uh, we take out of that frame, we say uh, we need X amount of teams to work on that, in that business item. And the business item priority comes from cost of delay and business case calculations and so on. Yeah. So probably this much time into these many people, roughly this much cost, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that, that much cost is accruing due to implementing all this stuff. Yeah. And, and this is the return on investment we expect, and you're optimizing those things. Yeah, so we cut here and, and we can continue a bit if you like. <laughs> so you can come to the front and yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>